<laughs> I was shivering. My stomach hurt. I, I felt I felt the, the nerves any place. And um, the door opened, and the president went in. And then it was my turn, and the Pope sent out his hand. So I just did this. L'chaim, and welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. This week, I spoke to Wonder Woman. Well, that's what some people call her, but I saw this fantastic, incredible video that you probably saw also by Rabbi Yoel Gold on his awesome channel, which were linked down below. And I was blown away. I was, I was inspired. I was crying. And I'm like, I need to have a full interview with this person. So she is someone that stands her ground and she literally has world leaders. That's multiple, not just one world leader, world leaders bowing to her, which is incredible. And you're going to hear a story and you hear who she is and what she stands for. And she's really inspirational. This episode, at the end of the episode, you're going to hear a mini interview about the OU's women's initiative that is changing the world and you can get involved yourself um, and you're going to hear a lot more about them. You're also going to hear about a live podcast. Yes, you've been hearing about the Unrestricted Podcast, but now you could hear him live, Steve Savitsky, with an incredible guest. You're going to hear about him uh, live coming soon. So stick around for that. Now, here is my conversation. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Here I am together with Rivka Ravitz, all the way from Eretz Yisrael. You live in Yerushalayim? Next to Yerushalayim, Next Telstone. To, Telstone, okay, I've been to Telstone. So I, I, we're gonna talk about like a lot of your experiences and of course, you know, the way I knew who you were is from Yol Gold's, Rabbi Yol Gold's video. And we'll get to all of that. But first, could you take me back to, I guess, your childhood? What type of childhood did you have? So I was born in Jerusalem in um, one of the most uh, religious neighborhoods. Uh, it's called uh, Matersdorf, Shrotskin. Um, and I learned in the Beis Yaakov there in, in the neighborhood. My parents are American. They made Aliyah a few years before I was born. So we did speak English mm-hmm. at home um, until I went to school and learned my Hebrew. Uh, did you like a lot of American Israeli children that I knew, that I know, they like as they got more into the system they're like i don't want to do english anymore like oh my friend just speak hebrew so i want to speak hebrew no not that but sometimes as if i look uh, if i look at it we spoke like very funny english saying i'm going to the makolet to buy him ah you know things uh, like that like a, <laughs> and we were, we were really sure we had speaking english like it was right. funny yeah but I, i'm okay with english yeah um and my parents now, as a, an adult, I understand they didn't have a lot of money, but they never gave us this feeling. So we almost didn't buy, let's say, new clothing and things like that. We had um, family here in the States, and they were sending us bags of secondhand uh, clothing, and we loved that. We felt good with that. And also food, like my mother was buying cheaper food and preparing everything by herself and sewing things and things like that. My father will... Uh, repair things if, if they will break chairs uh closets beds like nothing new but i never felt like um bad with that mm-hmm. and then i went to learn a seminary in base yakov seminary in geula i learned to be a teacher an an english teacher i was pretty young at the age of 18 and a half i got married to uh my husband, he's a son of a politician. His father was then a member of, of parliament, of Knesset. And for you at that point, did you have anything to do with politics? Nothing. Right. I didn't even know. Today, I know I don't like politics, but then I, <laughs> I didn't even know that. Like, right, okay. My parents were so disconnected. No paper, no television, of course, like things. Um, so I didn't know anything. I was really... Uh, and he was a son of a member of Knesset and my husband, he knew everything and like, it was funny. Um, and I was still learning in seminary when we got married and I really wanted to be a teacher. And I even got a, a, a place to be a teacher and that's not easy in Jerusalem. Right. There's a lot of Haredi young girls uh, learning to be teachers and everyone wants a, a few jobs. So I was very happy I got a job and it was not a full job, not a full-time job. It was like 
maybe two days a week to teach or something like that, but I was happy with that. And we were still like a young couple, no children. And then there was again elections. It was a summer and his father was again elected to be member of Knesset and he got a very good place. Uh, he was like uh, ranked high. So Netanyahu, that was elected for the first time in his life to be a prime minister of Israel then, it was 96 or 7, um, offered my father-in-law to be the head of the finance committee of the Knesset. Yeah. That's a very professional finance and, and has a lot of influence. That's the finance that uh, brings the budget of the government, of all the ministries of all Israel. Um, so my father-in-law was very happy with that and he he consulted his rabbis, but he took that job and then he asked me if I would uh, like to come and be his intern in the Knesset. So I said, no way, I'm You're a teacher. teacher. Yeah. I'm an English teacher, I was so happy with that. And so he said, how much would you earn as a teacher? So I calculated the two days a week, like, uh, and I said 700 shekels a, a month. That's $150 a month. So he said, no way, you're not going there. Come with me. The salary is at the Knesset is a bit better. Hmm. And I went with him, even though I didn't want. And I was his assistant. I was uh, helping him, like preparing all those um, meetings before bringing the budget up and and it was really very professional I, I I learned math and I'm good with numbers so I had the base but I didn't know anything so I was taking home a lot of papers and books <laughs> to read to be prepared for the uh, for the meetings that, uh, the next days and I, I probably did well so uh, I stayed with him for three years and then came a new law in the Knesset that you can't uh, work with a first gra grade uh, relative. Yeah, like uh, nepotism. Nepotism, yeah. It was to fight uh, nepotism. So um, I had to leave his office. And then Reverend Rivlin, he was the head of the Likud party in the Knesset. He had his daughter working for him too. Yeah. And she left his office and he was left with no... Uh, parliamentarian assistant so I went and w worked for him like as is parliamentarian did assistant did his daughter go to your father-in-law no, <laughs> no. like they did a little flip <laughs> we didn't flip no okay. she got a good job in the Knesset ah okay so you started working for him so I started working for him uh, I was already maybe 21 or 22 years old and I had three uh, young daughters at that age and that was really a shock for me like I used I came from Beis Yaakov to the Knesset that was a big shock also right but I still was in a in a Haredi office in a Jew in a from uh, right. environment right and now I uh, I'm still young I'm still um I do have experience but I'm and I'm, I'm going into a very uh, secular office of all men or uh so I was his parliamentarian assistant for maybe one year and then we helped Arik Sharon become a uh, prime minister. He, lo he lost his wife, Lily, and he was really, he was <laughs> such a miskin, you know, he was really, he didn't want anything. And they were very good friends, Rivlin and Sharon. And Rivlin told them, you will be the, prime, the next prime minister. And he helped him to become the next prime minister. So he gave him a, a nice job to be a minister. Hmm. Um, so at the age of 22, or maybe I was 23, I became the chief of staff to the, uh, the head of office to the Minister of Communications of Israel. No Haredi uh, before ran a uh, office of a minister. Did because you feel we like didn't have so Haredi out of place? Like... Yeah, it was really like, I didn't believe he'll give me this job. Uh. And it, I was really, I was not saying I was the first woman, woman, first Haredi. Wow. Because we didn't have Haredi ministers until 10 years later. So like I was a first and, and a from lady and, and a job like that. And that was really hard. Ministers in Israel work a lot around the clock. It's hard for anyone, but especially being a young mother, yeah. also from an environment where like, you know, oh, being a teacher is the typical, but then... <laughs> You're in that space. It's not easy. 
wasn't easy. So why do you continue doing it? Why do you be like, this is nice, but maybe I'll go do something else? So sometimes I had points like that, that I felt I'm just not going tomorrow back to office. But my husband was really very supportive. Always he said, you could do that. Don't uh, look around. Don't uh, uh, feel bad if people say this or say that. Uh, so I went on. I don't know. It was like, it just went on, even though. And, and what is your husband? What does your husband So do? my husband is also a politician. Mm-hmm. And he he was uh, for almost 20 years uh, the deputy mayor. Betar Elite, if you know, mm. and then he was uh, he was running f- three or four years ago to be the mayor mm. of Telstone, and he took that job, and uh, he's very happy with that. He's a very good mayor. Wow, wow. Okay, so you're you're back to there. So at this point that you're progressing, I guess, in your career, how many children do you have at this point? Um, so I had my fifth. Uh, I had her at the office of uh, communications. Um, I didn't take a maternity leave then. Hmm. I like was maybe a ha- week and a half wow. at home, and then came really very fast back to the office. Um, and then he wanted to be. He like had a dream all around all the years. He had a dream to be the speaker of the Knesset. That's a very that's the highest job in the Knesset in Israel. And it's like, if you, in Israel, you could see you have a president and then the speaker of the Knesset and then the prime minister. Like wow. it's really the second. And he really had a dream to be that. And we had, uh, it was not easy campaign, but he he took it, he made it. And that was probably in 2006. And he won. Yeah. He wanted when he won were you more excited or more like nervous i was very nervous i was very excited of course right, because yeah, we yeah, worked yeah. so hard that, but i was really very nervous it was not easy but it's it's a it's a very it's a nice job it's very interesting because the the knesset in israel is very um live like everything happens there there's three days a week that the prime minister sits in the knesset everything is around knesset like it's really and all the ministers have offices in the Knesset and Monday, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, they, s- they sit in the Knesset. So it's like the a very central uh, place to be in and a very nice place. I-, I would go back to the Knesset. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so fine. So at that point, I-, I know there's a lot of wonderful stories with you and like world leaders. Like at what point are you meeting all those people? So no, that's not then yet. And the Knesset, uh, the work is um, in it's Israel. It's just there in the Knesset. Yeah, you do a lot of laws, mm. a lot of uh, regulations, all those uh, authorities and the committees of the Knesset, we we run them and everything. And then at um, 2014, uh, he wanted to, we tried also in twenty. Um, seven, like 2007, mm-hmm. he tried to become a president and, and we failed and Shimon Peres uh, became. And then seven years after in Israel, the president is for seven years. Mm-hmm. So at 2014, and that probably was the hardest campaign uh, we ever had together. It was really very um, complicated because he was part of the Kud party, but Netanyahu didn't support him. Mm. So he had to find supporters from Haredi parties, from Arab parties, from Avoda, from Labour Party. Well, from Haredi parties, I'm saying I feel like that's your domain. No, like I feel like you, if there's anyone who would be so me a little bit, and my husband helped a lot. Right, he was also with us those uh, days. It was more than a. It was almost a year we worked for that. So that's a crazy year. A crazy year. I had my 11th daughter and that year. And I think she probably, she didn't see me as a mother. She see, she thought my mother is her mother. And, wow. I'm, and I'm some aunt to something coming in, bringing presents. Was that hard for you? I mean, like, yeah, because I don't know, it's one of being a mother and being yeah. there. It was not easy. But but I, I really, I was into it. Mm-hmm. And it was uh, it was uh, it was interesting. And for someone listening who's not from the world of like eleven children, and I think you have twelve children. Yes. So 
I mean, each interview I saw, like, there's always like, you, you're like, oh, you had eight in- kids by that interview, then 10, 11. So mm-hmm. now I don't know, maybe you had like 15. Okay, 12. So um, for someone who's not from that world, it, it was, could, could you just explain, like, if that's typical for someone in your world to like have 12 children and be in the position that you're in? So, first of all, Haredi families are big in Israel. Around um, most of my friends have between seven and nine children. So I'll say the normal size of family is seven children. Um, so 12 was a bit abnormal. It's a lot more votes if you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not why you yeah. <laughs> My husband thinks about that. <laughs> um, so it's a bit, it's, it's like a big family in Israel, but not too big, you know, it's not so, uh, so weird. Um, but, and, and, and another thing I'll say that most of my friends, most of Haredi women work out mm. of home, um, about 90%. But most of them are teachers. Mm. And that's a job that's it's, it's easier right, it to run with you children. You could be around, you're around the kids, you could be home. And you for... have vacation when your kids are home, and right. you have vacation at Holy Days, and Erev Pesach, and Erev Sukkot, things that I did in have Hanukkah, you know. So how do you get bought? I mean, I have two kids and I'm like falling apart because it's so not easy. I'll and give you, I'll tell you a secret. Yeah. Don't let anyone to know. It gets easier from the third. Really? Are you saying I have to, okay. Try it. That. Why? Because you give I up at that point? I, with like saying like, okay, they'll do whatever they do. I think I became softer and like experienced and it became easier and they also have one each other. Mm. And it's not that they take care of one each other. I, I had to take care of, of all those 12, but they have one each other. So sometimes if they are mad at something or if they're alone, they could talk one to each other. It, it, it takes off from you, from your shoulders a little Interesting. bit. Interesting, you're saying like the kids, like whether they become friends or they're just there with each other. So in terms of playing, now all of a sudden, as opposed to if you just have one, you're going to be the one playing with them. But now the five-year-old is going to play with the three-year-old. Yeah. Well, so that, Interesting. Okay, yeah. so that's okay. That's good advice. Because it's funny, because in like typical America, now I'm not talking like the Orthodox world, typical America, like one, two, three, a dog. But you're saying <laughs> the, to make it easy. Maybe, okay, maybe America should do this. So if they had more children, it would be easier being parents. Okay, that's interesting. Fine. So at that point... So it's not typical to have a job in the government mm-hmm. and have uh, seven or nine. Or I jumped from seven to nine because I had twins. Oh, wow. Well. So it's, it was not typical at all. But it was typical to have big families. And it was typical, even if you have a big family, to go and work out from home. So the, the part of, of about your story, I guess, that was not typical is the fact that you were in a job in the government, uh, particularly, particularly in an area where like Haredi Orthodox people typically are not. I'll tell you another thing. It was not typical for a woman in those days at mm-hmm. the 90s and at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. At all, well, at the Knesset, there were not a lot of women in those um, high jobs. Did you ever get pushed back from like, Rabbanim or just from? No, the no. truth is not. No. Interesting. S- sometimes I have questions and right. I, and I, I get uh, boundaries and, and borders, but I never felt like no. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. So you, you said that year was crazy that he's running for president and yeah. he won. And he won it. Were you shocked or? I was totally shocked. Really? Because it was like the uh, the process was that he lost the first um, uh, first time around. Vote, yeah, the, right. f- the first round. And then we had another round. And when they were uh, counting the, the the numbers, it's just 120 voters. You know, it's the Knesset votes for the president in Israel. And they were they came to the 40th or something, and we and we we were not there. And we said, okay, we lose it. Let's let's uh, lock the door and go back home. <laughs> and in and in two minutes, it's like flip, and it was everything changed. We were all shocked. You know, we yelled and jump. We were yelling and jumping and uh, dancing, and like it was crazy. Do you feel your life changed after that, or already your life has been was gradually shifting? Probably changed uh, at that point because um, when we came back to office, so he he offered me to just choose which. Uh, title and job I would like. And I said, I want to be 
chief of staff. I was just uh, 37 then. And I didn't believe he'll give me that job. And he and he did. Wow. Never was a woman, a chief of staff, the prime minister, the president in Israel before. Wow. And also not. Why do you want that position? I like those positions that you have an eye on everything. Like nothing happens all around the office and the building uh, without going through you. <laughs> I like wow. that. Yeah. So, okay. At that point. So, so. I want to get to the stories because there's some incredible stories with you and like leaders. Um, so could you tell me a little about your experience with, let's, um, let's start with Putin. Okay. Um, there's, there's a story about him making a remark about Jews. Could, could you tell us that story? Yes. So um, we had to travel to Putin because of, there was a crisis with some uh, Arabic um, state. Around what year Our neighbors, uh, probably 2016. Okay. And we needed his help. He had a lot of influence. He has a lot of influence on Turkey and on um, Syria and on Iran and things like that. So we, we needed his, his help with one of those. So we were just were traveling from um, this moment to, to another. Like we uh, asked for a meeting. And when he said yes, we just took ourselves and traveled to Moscow. And we prepared ourselves uh, very well for the meeting. We brought our military at a show with us, and he was preparing us and giving us papers and issues. And we were like, there, it was a very serious uh, uh, meeting. Are you, uh, I, and I'm just asking, because like, I would be nervous, but that's just me. Were you nervous by these meetings? Like, Of with, course. Yeah, okay. Because it's, at the end of the day, it's my, uh, it's my duty to see that the president says the right things and I'm sitting there and I, ha I have to go over the maps with those two presidents and to say the right things and not to, to and, and it's like, it's a lot of details and a lot of names and a lot of, um, so yeah, I was of course very nervous and, and I was even additionally nervous at this point because I knew Putin is a very strong I'll say dictator, right? You say it's okay. I, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> this is you saying it. Yeah, I have to be careful, but I'm not on duty anymore, so I could say. Um, even I'll tell you, when I go to meet uh, presidents and kings, so I ask Shaila if I should uh, bench uh, Baruch Shechalak, and usually Reb Chaim Kanievsky said you could bench, but without uh, Shemu Malchus. Mm -hmm. And this time I have it. I have it on, uh, I have his audio saying uh, by phone, he was telling me I could say the bench, the whole bench with Shema Malchus because Putin is a leader who has the will to kill. Wow. And he kills. So um, so I was benching and then we finished that meeting. It was supposed to be 40 minutes, but it it was two hours and that was a good sign. And he we got like positive um, answers for him, from him. And then he said, I want to I want to invite you for a dinner, for a state dinner. And that was what was surprising. Like was we just came for, for a working meeting. We didn't come for a state dinner, for a state visit. So he was not. If I was in, and this is me just coming from my like American background. If I was in a movie at this point and like a world leader, like Putin, like everything went well. And you're like, okay, great. Now let's leave. And he's like, no, no, maybe you should stay a little longer. Like I'd be like, okay. He's, gonna do something to us. like I'm not staying but now we can't say no because he said that I'd be freaking out so a little. he didn't do anything bad it was okay, crazy yeah. like he he really had us for a beautiful dinner everything was like so nice the, the forks were from gold and and everything was kosher he he's he heard that there's one from lady and the delegation so he brought everything glut Kosher. Wow. Even the wine, there was a, a from man standing and, and uh, pouring the uh, the wine. Um, Sharmashkin. Mamash, yeah. He's like, I hope so he doesn't nice. have a stone in there. Or, yeah. <laughs> and it, it was like nine portions and everything was so elegant and so nice. And I was really sitting like uh, so close to him and hearing and uh, talking like chatting. And then he's, What language? What language is going on? He speaks English. Oh, okay. So English, what? Interesting. When we had the formal meeting, it was, and we had a translator from Russian to Hebrew. He didn't, he was not willing to speak uh, English. And then we brought our translator with us for the, for the dinner. 
and then he spoke perfect English. Wow. I was crazy. Yeah, so you're sitting right near and he's speaking and English. And he was take, uh, talking and he was telling us this uh, story. He was uh, saying he wants to tell us a story about his child, childhood. So he was telling us that he was born at the skirts of uh, St. Petersburg. They were such a poor family. They didn't even have money to live in town. And he was an only child and his parents worked very hard. So... He had to look for his place and he says he found at the same block a nice family that was hosting him afternoons, helping him with homework, giving him food. And he really loved that family and he spent a lot of time with them. And just one thing was rare. At Friday's afternoons, the mother will light candles and they will all sit down to a festive uh, dinner. Hmm. Yeah, and as he became older and he became a politician and a leader, he understood they were Jews. And he says that, what, he was saying this in his words. Uh, since then, he tried to treat Jews as good as he could. Um, so the, the story sound better three years ago. <laughs> Today and these days, it's... Uh, right, yeah. It's sad. But I, I remember thinking to myself... First of all, this is like a lot of about of the power of, of the mother. Uh, you know what? The power of parents. Even if they were not his parents, but he felt like a family environment and they gave him such a good feeling and it stayed with him. He probably was maybe five years old, maybe seven. It stayed with him for 60 years and it changed his mind as a world leader. That's tremendous power we have in our hands as parents and as Jews. That's really beautiful. We'll be right back to this week's episode. But first, you've been hearing me talk about the incredible Unrestricted Podcast. We are each week or each episode, I should say, Steve Savisky sits down with an incredible guest who has some really high power and influence in the community and the world, frankly, and they are now retired or they moved on and they could talk freely about their position and what they've done. And it's phenomenal. It's an easy lesson. It's great. And it's just a fun time. So you have an opportunity to go to a live recording of the podcast. Yes, Steve Savitsky will be going to the five towns, or I say coming to the five towns, on June 1st, 8 p.m., and it's going to be incredible. Young Israel of Lawrence Cedarhurst, be there or be square at 8 p.m. because Steve will be interviewing, drum roll, that's my drum roll, it's terrible, I know. He's going to be interviewing the one, the only, Yaakov not me, Yaakov Katz, a lot bigger than me, the former editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. That is a person that I want to hear what it was like to be the editor for the Jerusalem Wow, There's a lot to talk about there, um, such an impact the Jerusalem Post has had on the Jewish world and the world at large. And I am very excited to, to be there, to listen, to hear Steve. He's great. If you haven't checked out his podcast yet, you are missing out. They're doing an incredible job. Unrestricted is fun, good, intelligent, and just a good listen. So go ahead and listen to them and be there June 21st, 2023 at 8 p.m. on Thursday. Be there or be square. But honestly, you could see more in the show notes. And really, if you didn't check out their podcast, go check them out. They're incredible. Now back to this week's episode. Okay, so I, I want to switch uh, world leaders. Um, I don't know if he's a world leader. Yeah, he's probably a world leader. Um, I want to switch to the story that I watched. And I was, I don't know why. I don't know, it's maybe Rabbi Yol Gold's uh, ability. Maybe it's you. It's crying when I watched that. And I'll, I'll link it on the bottom. Um, but the story of you and the Pope. Could you say over that story? And, yeah. and say it as if, I know you said it over. And I'm sure you said it a trillion times. But say it as if, because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people watching and listening that didn't get to hear it. So, so I want to say a word before I'm trying and starting the story about Rabbi Yol Gold, because yeah, sure. um, a long time people told me, you have to tell your story to Yol Gold. And, you know, I was so busy. And so I just, I didn't do anything with that. And one day I saw one video of him saying some story about uh, um, someone, uh, Chazan, how you say, uh, um, davening in shul. Um, a singer, a, a cantor? A cantor. Okay. Uh, some cantor, uh, Say, uh, doing something in Yom Kippur. I even don't remember the story. I just started seeing the story. I was crying. So he probably has 
something and the way he knows how to tell stories and that's amazing because that's really so much power I think he's trying to make us cry I really do I mean it's fine it's a good outcome but I think he's like I have to imagine because all his videos are so they push you like emotionally to like really it's beautiful in my yeah. eyes and I saw that and at that moment I just called him and I you said I'm him, in yeah okay. I'm, I'm doing it um, so that was also around some crisis we had with uh, with Jordan and with the Palestinians about some small um, land called the Monstries um, land. And the, uh, the government of Israel wanted very much to have a tourist uh, uh, take of that place. But the Palestinians had problems and the Jordanians has pro- had problems that it was very important for the government. So they asked the president, you know, not any leader, each leader could could meet the Pope. The Pope is uh, meets only presidents and only once in a month, I think he meets a, a, a leader. So we, they were asking us to go and uh, try to meet the Pope. And we really uh, reached out. And it took it took uh, maybe a month or two until he was willing to to meet us, um, and then he invited us to come to the Vatican, and we were all very excited. First of all, because he's he's of course a, a world leader. He has millions of uh, maybe probably billions of uh, of people around the world. So we prepared ourselves very well. I remember even the Prime Minister Netanyahu who came into the preparations, uh, he came into our office and he explained everything and it was really, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs and every, everyone were, was really excited of us uh, traveling there and we bought a, a special present, we went to the, Israel, the Museum of Israel and we took some uh, olive branch and yeah. did something with I that. I would have given him like a Tzahal sweatshirt or something. <laughs> Good idea. Okay, all in French. Okay, that that makes probably more sense for the book. Yeah, we we were having a story. Give him like a little like you know yarmulke with a mug and David again because he wears a yarmulke. I don't Maybe know. Maybe a, ki- a kiddish. Uh, a cup. Yeah, that could also. Okay, so you got an olive branch. So we yeah we went um, we traveled to the Vatican and when we came to Rome again the ambassadors I don't know if you know there are two separate. Uh, um, States, right? Yeah, Vatican's a, its own country. Yeah, even though it's like little, it's well, not small, little, small, tiny, but it's like a block compared yeah. to the entire. They have them, the, their uh, prime minister and their police and everything. And so the two ambassadors came with us, and and they were explaining us the protocol, how the meeting will go on. So they t- told us when we come into the Vatican, each one of us will be accompanied by a very high ranked cardinal. Some of them, they told us, have money more than all the budget of the Israeli government. Wow. Yeah, they're very rich. Um, and then they told us we will be walking in two lines uh, through a few long halls. Uh, our delegation will stand uh, according to rank, like the president first, I'm second, my, my staff, uh, three more of my staff behind me, and then... Uh, our cardinals and we were walking uh, and you will be walking they said uh, a few halls and at the last hall the cardinals will leave you alone and then you know you are at the last hall at the end of the last hall there's a door and stand before the door the pope will be opening the door and uh, come he will uh, bring you in each one should give a small bow shake hands with him and get a small present and go in. Um, so at this point, I stopped the ambassador and I said, um, "Listen, uh, I don't shake hands with men. I mean, it's you know, it's not a fixed halacha. It's a it's a chumra, but I yeah. I took that chumra and I don't shake hands with uh, with men. Uh, so please let him know because usually when I don't shake hands, I bow politely right, right. and i uh, and i say i'm sorry i can't shake hands with men but i i knew i, c- I couldn't bow before the pope because i knew he will be wearing a big cross so i asked the ambassador to prepare him and and to tell him i won't be shaking hands uh, so the ambassador no problem so you tell him i'm not going to be shaking hands i won't be bowing i don't have to say i won't be bowing okay. because you know 
um that's fine uh-huh. a, a bear is just a like right. a polite you got know. It, got it. yeah so he said oh, no problem i'll say that and it's not so uh crazy to say that because people some people don't shake hands it was before COVID, but there were already people that were not shaking hands for uh health uh right. reasons so also I'm like religious. if there's anyone who understand like you know he, he he's the leader of a very big religion like he, i'm sure he knows about religions and Okay, so yeah. let's see. But that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we were, we, okay, we went to sleep and we woke up early and we were all prepared to go down to our uh, black uh, vehicles waiting for, for us uh, downstairs. And just to double check, I was like going to the ambassador. I think his name was Jacob or something. I, yeah, Jacob. Uh, I'm just doubling, uh, just, just checking with you. You remembered, you told the, the cardinal, the chief cardinal. Wow, Rivka, I'm so sorry I forgot. It was such a hectic day. I had so many things to do yesterday. I just forgot calling him and now it's too late. But listen, Rivka, this, this is such an important meeting. So I'm sure if you, you, will, be, if you will call your rabbi, he will give you a, a heter one time. You could shake hands. It's really important. So I didn't want to do that. Uh, so I didn't call my rabbi. And it just went on, and we got to the Vatican, and I was nervous. Well, if this doesn't go well, then you won't get the support of him, and then whatever conflict's going and on. I'll be the one to It'll to be ruin. your fault. Yeah. You know, a few million people dying because of you. No. <laughs> okay, so. I was really nervous at this point. And but as hold on. If I were you, why wouldn't you just call your, your Rav? Your you Rav would? Back? What? You would? Yeah, I think so. Because... At the end of the day, he'll it, the weight will be on him, not on me, and I don't know what to do. And it, listen, if he gives me a hat there, he gives me a hat there, and if not, then I'm in trouble. But I didn't think of a hat there. You didn't I want really... you didn't want it to be. You don't. No. You just didn't want to shake it. Yeah, you said it's just... mine. It's it's a thing. It's a chamra I took on myself. I know it's not a halacha. Right. It's a chamra I took on myself, and and saying this is one of the ways that you connect Hashem, and you don't want to settle on it, even if it's. Whatever yeah. potentially could be it was important for me, right? Um, so we just went. I, I went af- after the president, and we really get accompanied by all those cardinals, and we were going through uh, those halls. And at the moment they left us, I understood that's the last hall, and I was, uh, I think, <laughs> I was shivering. My stomach hurt. I, I felt, I felt the nerves any place, and um, the door opened. And the president went in, and then it was my turn, and the Pope sent out his hand. So I just did this. I was like standing pretty hands still, back, yeah. Right. And I, I just explained to him. I told him, "I'm a religious uh, woman. I'm coming from a religious uh, community, and we don't shake hands with men." What language is this? English. He speaks English. I'm or not sure translate? about him speaking English because there was a translator. Ah, uh-huh, okay. I think he does. Got it. Okay. Yeah, so but you there was a, 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 tra- a translator, and she translated. Which is like, what and he was I- surprised. Really? Yeah. Surprised? Like, what was his facial expression? Oh, really? He said uh-huh. people still keep that. Oh wow. Oh, tell me about that community. So I told him, and I also told him about my father-in-law. And I, I and I and I thought about my. What father. do you mean, your father? I told him I'm I'm from a family uh, of um, of Rabbi Avram Ravitz. He was the head of the Haredi party in the Knesset, and that's a big community in Jerusalem. It's not a small uh, Hamish uh, community, you know. It's 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 a lot of uh, it's people. Large, right. He was really surprised. And if each one of uh, the delegation got a uh, second with the Pope, so I had five minutes of explaining wow. and. He's like generally interested. And then he... And then he just gave me a bow. I don't know how it happened. Like he was... He Who took that it. picture? Who, there's, a, there's a picture, <laughs> uh, a which hopefully we'll, yeah. we'll flash it on the screen for those watching. Chaim Tzach, his name. He's a good photographer. Oh, he's, he's a... Okay. He's official. He's very... I mean, he snapped that moment. Um, he also took my picture with Biden. Oh, we'll get to Biden. We'll get to Biden <laughs> next. Hold on. So with the Pope... Okay, so he bowed to... And then... And then and then everything went well, even, right. even more than well. We really, uh, it was a very good meeting. It's so funny because I think so many times in life we're like put in these type of positions. No, okay, not like with the Pope, but we're put in these positions where we're like, we're thinking, whether it's with just, you know, r- religious things or just in general, like we think we're going to have to do things a one way and that's going to be the best way. And like Hashem's like, no, 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 like do things the right way and you'll be taken care of. 
I'm the one to, uh, to put the path for you. Right. It's funny because I, listen, I, I'll come clean. There's definitely been situations where like I'm by business meeting and like a woman sticks out her hand and like not to be awkward, I just go with it. And also I don't shake women in women's hands, but I've done it because out of like just sheer awkwardness and like here I'm hearing your story and I'm just like thinking like all those, like I know there's guys in business that they're like, listen, it's for business. And they spoke to a rub, they got a there and now they're not wearing their yarmulke. But it's not as like dire and like you're in this situation where it's really, really, really important to make a good impression. And then you're like, listen, my principles are my principles and I can't. I want to tell you, it's not always easy. And sometimes the stories don't finish. So um, there have been times that this happened where like, you're yeah, things happened. And really? also when this story like was, it was nice and he was so nice and the, and the meeting was great. But when I came back to Israel, the Foreign Affairs Ministry was very upset at me. Really? Yeah. I got... Uh, well, they're also coming from the world of like, they're not Haredi and there's there's maybe some... Not religious at Difference all. in opinion of how to do things. So they're looking at you and they're like, this crazy really Haredi upset. lady, what are, you, what are you doing to like potentially ruin everything? Yeah. They were really upset. Oh, I didn't see that part in the old gold video. Yeah. No, I never told that to anyone, but but it's not, it's not always easy, right. you know, it's like... You th- some- sometimes you have a happy end and sometimes the end is not so happy. I think it's important to people to know that not it's not always, okay, you stand for your uh, uh, religious values, you get a prize at that moment. It's not always like that. But the, the, uh, the th- that thing that you stood for, I think that's the prize. Mm. The moment you stood for your values, that itself is is a sort of a prize. It's nice. I mean, it's so funny because like growing up, we're taught about like Olam Haba and, you know, after 120, if you're good, then you get good things, which is great for a five-year-old. But like as you get older, that's not really, maybe it's something that's going to happen. Doesn't but, work. But you, Doesn't you, always work. You, you're not supposed to be a good person because you're going to get rewarded. Good. You're to be a good person because you're saying. You want to be good. You want to be good. And that in itself is the Olam Haba, the, the reward. The and heaven. also the Olam Haza, I think. Wow. Wow. So let's shift to the Biden story. Okay. So world leader after world leader. Okay. So now what year is this that you're meeting Biden? So Biden, it's 2021, mm-hmm. okay? After COVID is almost, it still was uh, sort of COVID. Well, for, for Biden, COVID just finished. Yeah. <laughs> and like, no, but, it was still. Yeah, was yeah, still. yeah. Hey, March 2020. So 2021 is still very yeah. fresh. Right. But we didn't travel at all for from February 2020, it was a 2019, 2019, I think. No, COVID started in 2020. 2020? Yeah. Okay. In Maybe in Israel. Years, no, 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 no. 2020. Okay. Yeah. So th- since February 2020 until j- this June or July 2021, we didn't travel. It was almost a half a year and a half. You're like, I, I didn't yeah. meet a king in so long. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that was great. I loved it. All right. I just okay. had a baby. It's September 2019. So he was just a half a year. And I... I was traveling uh, when he was two months and when he was four months and then everything stopped and I was such a good mom and he, he loved it and I loved it. So we didn't travel. And then um, we knew at July, 2021, Revlin is finishing his term. In Israel, you are a president for seven years and that's all you can't run for another term. Mm-hmm. And then we got an, a nice invitation from the White House that Biden is inviting Rivlin to come and say goodbye. And we were already at the White House twice. Uh, Obama invited us once and Trump invited us once. And I met Clinton before um, and I met Bush as he was the uh, Speaker of the Knesset, the head of the parliament. So I really probably met six of uh, the um, American I'm presidents. I'm so curious, I mean, politics aside, because I happen to not care about politics at all, what were they like as people? Like you're getting to like see them like firsthand. Okay, I'm sure they're putting on their best. Uh, no, Clinton forward. was very nice. Obama was brilliant. Mm-hmm. He spoke so nice. My claim to fame, <laughs> and again, I'm not into politics. I don't choose. I uh, Barack Obama follows me on Twitter. I don't know why. Well, and he's the most followed person on Twitter as of now. Probably Elon Musk. I must tell him. you that, um, I, you you 
you know what? I'll tell you it later. When oh, ask no, because all the <laughs> listeners are going to be like, do you want to say it now? Then maybe we'll cut it out. No, I want to tell when you ask me about that person, that uh, the guy that uh, like the most influential. Uh, oh, got it, got it. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay, fine. Because that's Obama. I always say that about and, him. You know what? Let's yeah. just do it now. Okay. So um, he was coming for the funeral of uh, Shimon Peres. And that was like from a moment to a moment. Uh, Paris uh, passed away at Wednesday, and the funeral was on early For Friday. For those who don't know, Shimpera was the former president. Yeah, he was the f- president before us, and he's pr- pretty known. He was, yeah, yeah. He was like an international figure. Um, and Obama said, I'm coming, was like, wow. Usually we prepare a month before getting any any president of the world, even if it's the president of uh, EA, come on, I don't know what. like. But Obama, like an American president, so many security issues, and we were going crazy. And he traveled for uh, 12 hours, and the funeral was a half hour after he landed. I, I escorted him that day. I was with him the whole day. And they told us he will uh, speak at the funeral, and that was very special, too. What? what, what he had a, a close relationship with Probably, him? Probably, yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. interesting. But they said his staff asked us to put those, um, how you call those, um, two uh, glass um, screens oh, that yeah. he could talk from them. Uh, we call them in Hebrew ping pong. I don't know how you call them. That's so amazing. You know that? Them. No, I didn't know that. Ping pong? Yeah, it's called in Hebrew ping pong, and um, it's two uh, glass uh, yeah, screens. And whenever these things happen, people always text me like, that's the word. Um, so they will text me. Um, I'm thinking of like, not podium. It's not a podium. It's, it's, you so have you a read podium. It, uh, teleprompter. It's okay. A so it's not a teleprompter. We had a, tra- a teleprompter. We okay. have one, a very good one, but they didn't want that. It's not. Why enough. would we call it anything else than ping pong? That's the <laughs> best name ever. Okay, we could call it ping pong. So it's two screens. A teleprompter is one screen that stands be- before you, and w- you read your speech, and it looks like you speak by by heart. So what's a ping pong? And a ping pong is better because in a teleprompter you're on, uh, all the time looking to one point, and a ping pong you're looking to two points, and then and also that you, audience feels that you're looking to the. I audience. need a ping pong for when I do like intros and outros of this podcast. It's very expensive, so we didn't oh, have shoots. one. If anyone has a leftover ping pong, yeah. Out there. Okay, so so we didn't have one, oh, and we didn't put, and they didn't want that tele- our teleprompter, and he came after twelve hours of traveling, a surprising travel night. Like, and he stood up and spoke by heart. So nice. He gave such a speech. And I said, wow, he's not reading this. He's not, uh, he didn't wrote, write that. It's not a teleprompter and it's not a ping pong. And that, that was really um, impressive. So why did we say that? Ah, okay. So I met a few of the American presidents. Yeah. But we were all excited um, from this invitation. And we uh, took a plane straight. We didn't take a, a hotel. It was still COVID. We didn't want to take some anything, any um, uh, risk. So we just took a plane very early in the morning, got to Washington, and late in the night came back. And everything was the same as five, uh, three years before with Trump and seven years before with Obama. The same saloon. Uh, it's called the Roosevelt saloon and they were uh hosting us there of course before we were going through a lot of um security checkings and after they finished to check you for security so they don't let you out of your room all those guys of security standing around the room and you could just go straight to the car with like really funny feeling and we came uh, became uh, going into the White House and uh, some lady came out and she was escorting us and taking us to the Roosevelt Saloon. Just the same, you know, the same curtains, the same uh, rug, the same, even the same um, cookies were waiting for us there. Mm. Chocolate uh, um, chips cookies and and M&M's candies with those boxes. I had um, one signed by Obama and then I had one signed by Trump and now I have one signed by uh, Biden too. Mm. Um, and then the lady was telling us, listen, it's uh, the fast, the last visit, uh, state visit for President Ridlin. Let, let us have a few minutes for them alone, alone. Just the two uh, leaders. And uh, we, we call that in Hebrew a tete-a-tete meeting. Okay. So uh, he let us wait for like maybe 15 minutes. I'm not sure he was very busy, but he made a, the Israelis wait. Um, and after 15 minutes, the door 
at the end of the, the salon was opened and he invited the president to come into the oval room. That's really oval, you know, it's really round. And um, I don't know how it happened. President Reland just said, Rivka, come with me. <laughs> and I went into the private meeting. So we were just the three of us in the room and his lady was standing in the, in the side. And it was an, such a nice talk, like they were talking uh, off the record about um, some environment issues maybe, and then how's your wife, how's your wife? And then Biden goes, and who's this young lady in the room? So Revlin said, this is my chief of staff. Her name is Rivka. And Biden just reached out to shake hands with me. So Revlin said, no, no, don't try. Mm. <laughs> she doesn't shake hands with men, she's religious. And guess how many children she has? And didn't uh, let Biden to guess. He just answered and said, Rivka has 12 children. And at this point, <laughs> Biden almost fainted. He was looking at me like this. Saying, Is that true? Do you have 12 children? And I said, yes, I do. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, you're so lucky. Oh, my mother should meet you. She loved huge families. I want to tell you a story about my mother, he says. But first, I have to about a mother of 12 and he just went down <laughs> on his knees he kneeled down and very fast he came back up like gentleman and took the two of us to the other side of the oval room to the end of the room and what do you think uh one of the the, the most uh famous and uh, important leader of the world has on her on a shelf in his working room a picture of his mother <laughs> And uh, he shows us a small picture. His mother is uh, very short, very old, wearing um, an elegant red dress. And on one side of her, I saw Obama standing so tall and Biden standing on the other side of her, two of them so tall. And he, he was telling us the story that this picture someone took on the day that Obama was here to be a president and he was appointed to be the vice president. And at one point of the ceremony, Obama freezed. And he uh, couldn't go on, like he was shocked. He was so uh, excited. So he, his mother just like slapped his, uh, his shoulder and said, come on boy, I'll take you on. And he like woke up and, and, went, and the ceremony went on and it, it, made, it made him laugh. I'll show you the picture him. It made him laugh so much so we had to, to laugh with him. But I was really impressed of, of a guy, not young anymore, such a big leader of the world, just telling us this melting story about his mother. And again, I told myself, we should tell this to ourselves as parents, how many influence we have on our children. It will stay with them for the rest of their lives. I was also thinking about my, my grandmother uh, at that split of moment, like was, it was really a split of moment. My, my grandmother was born in Jerusalem between the two uh, uh, world wars, probably 1920 or something like that. She was the, a girl at the age of three and there was no nothing to eat in Jerusalem and, and children were really dying from starvation. It was re really hard days in Jerusalem. And um, her mother, her father first came here to the States um, for trying to, you know, to have a leave, uh, something to eat for the children. And he, they, were, they were by themselves for two or three years. And then he sent tickets for them. And, and they uh, and her mother took three small children, maybe, I don't know, five, three, to, I don't know the ages, but really small. We have a picture of that uh, with a boat around the world. To uh, they came here to to New York, and my grandmother is telling me this story always that her mother didn't let them eat anything fleshic for three months because she didn't know if it's kosher, if it's uh, you know. So they just drank milk and ate milk eggs for three months. Small children, I'm sure if her mother will ask her, Rav, he will tell her, you could just let them eat what they want. Small children, it's, it's, it's war, it's uh, starvation. Just let the children eat. Mm -hmm. But she didn't ask a Shaila, you know. She I think just, that's where you get it from. <laughs> I'm not asking Shaila. Could be, yeah. She didn't. 
and and they were living here and they had a very good living and a very good business and at the moment they heard that israel um after the world uh, maybe the six days war or maybe i'm keep around i'm not sure they just left everything left the money left a beautiful house in flatbush and came uh, back to israel and she was admiring everything that was just like a government in in the states the president and if she was talking and she was also admiring me for working for government she was telling her friends she had a shiro pashat shavu every week and she was saying my granddaughter runs the country so i said <laughs> babi no i'm not running the country i'm just helping the president but really no she was really excited and she loved to come and visit me at the office and and if she would know she passed away a few months before i i visited biden but if she would know that the american president went down on his knees for me standing for my values and still uh, raising a big family he didn't do that because my name is rifka or because i'm a chief of staff you know he meets tens of chiefs of staff every week he just admired the idea that i stand up for my values and that i decided to give my life for family and that was i think what uh, um surprised him and if she would know that and if she would and she knows i, I believe that I, that i i do that from i got the power from her i think she will be very proud that's really beautiful there's um i i so i i watched one of your speeches and someone was like referring to you as wonder woman <laughs> and then the real life person who plays wonder woman like wanted to meet you or something like that oh that was so funny <laughs> i forgot that um yes that was funny we came to Los Angeles for um, the president was, uh, he wanted to speak with at the GA for, for the, uh, he said it's very important for, usually you don't go out of, of state for, uh, only if it's a state visit, like you go meet a president or something. But that time he said it's so important to talk with the young generation, the Jewish young generation. And, and so he, we traveled to Los Angeles. It was a very long travel. And I don't know why my Gmail was working. Probably there was a Wi-Fi on the plane or something. And I was just, we were pretty close to Los Angeles, maybe two hours. And I see in my uh, in, in box a message from... As someone who works for Gal Gadot, and he was, uh, he said, um, I hear, I heard the Israeli president is coming in, and we have a prima, um, event tomorrow for the, uh, movie, uh, Justice League. Justice League, yeah, yeah. Justice League. Okay. Justice League. Um, and we want the president to, to come and shake hands with, uh, Gal Gadot. Um, and next to me sat our, political advisor and I was uh, going uh, David look at this mail do you know who's Gal Gadot so he said uh, you're joking <laughs> you know Gal Gadot so I said no <laughs> like I don't watch movies never uh, we don't have television and I was never to a cinema and in my life so I didn't I really didn't know her um so he, he was laughing he said you're probably the the only woman in the world that doesn't know Gal Gadot <laughs> you're like but uh, listen you're like have you been to Sarotskin like <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> listen Rivka he says we are going to this uh, prima, uh, primera, you say? How you yeah, say? Premier. Premier. Yeah, premiere. We are going there because I need a selfie with Gal Gadot. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and he, he, when he just said that word, all my staff was on my uh, brain. We are going there. We need a selfie with Gal Gadot. So the president uh, was willing, of course. He was happy. And um, anyway, that was so funny because usually we we prepare for events like that a few days before and and the shin bet you know we a uh, president in israel has um he has security guards from from the shabak and we have work for before we go to, to such a place of course if it's such a um so many people around him and we didn't have much much of the time so i found myself usually my people do that but it was so late in the end uh, in the evening when we when we landed and and we had so much things to do so i just i i volunteered and said okay i'll go with the uh, with the uh, shabak uh, with the bodyguards and i found myself at the um it's called uh bollywood i think hollywood bollywood bollywood oh i'm not sure bollywood oh, is oh. like um i think the it's, it's a it's a very Hollywood? known cinema 
in the middle know. of the. Um, if you're asking me what's what's the Gemara and uh, whatever, then I can give I'll you an answer. I'll send you the name. Okay. I, I I wrote that it down for myself because. Um, but it's by a big cinema. It's a, it's a tremendous cinema in the middle of the uh, Hollywood um, with the that's the step walk that you have those. Um, the stars, the walk, yeah. of, uh, Hollywood Walk of Fame or something. Yeah, like yeah, that? yeah. The names like so. So it's. I heard there. my friend told me. I was, yeah, I, I was never there before. <laughs> I, so I was standing there in the middle of, and they, they prepared everything outside of the cinema. The, the occasion will probably be inside, but it was like tremendous, maybe three heights, um, uh, uh, all those like, um, those Wonder Woman, uh, like. Cosplay, people like dressing yeah, up like. Wonder yeah, 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 but tremendous the size of them. I never saw things like that. And like a statue? So elegant. Yeah, the like uh, real people, not real. They were made of I don't know what plastic or something, but they were tremendous, like three high. Uh, uh, like walking around? No, 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 just no, like a were, statue. Got yeah, it. wow. So there, it's funny, and everything was so elegant, and they were preparing food and drinks, and like everything was a nice sofas, black, uh, white, uh, beautiful. Everything was beautiful, and I never fa- I found myself in a place like that. And and the day after, we came in with a president, and that was like. Uh, millions of people uh, around her and the police put like fences because there were people jumping uh, on the fences to see her it was crazy and we we went into the fe- into the the circle uh, we were, she was standing and my staff was uh, horrible they all like <laughs> were acting so- <laughs> but she probably felt comfortable because she's here's this Israeli, like, Israeli yeah. woman and then yeah. like she, yeah, classic so Israelis nice. pushing to like go meet her she's like oh these are my people she she so nice. I'll send you the video and um okay and then it was like 10 or maybe 20 minutes maybe a half an hour we were there and we came back to the hotel and everyone was like in the, in the our office showing it to, on each other the the selfie mm-hmm. and then they said Rivka show us your selfie and I said I have no I didn't take one no that can't be they say you were standing next to Gagadot and you didn't take a selfie with her you're going back so I said listen I'm tired <laughs> I worked so hard today and um, I don't have patience to go back up but even I, if I would want to go back I'm, I'm telling them I can't because I just told the drivers to go home it was already nine o'clock or ten o'clock in the evening and it's very expensive to leave those drivers uh, so late I just everyone is home I, ha- I have no way to get there so the ambassador said take my car oh gosh <laughs> and I took his car with all his security and um, and I, and he called her, her husband um, Yaron Versano, his name. He called him and he said, "Listen, Rivka is coming. Wait for Rivka. Hmm. Don't, don't, uh, don't go." And and they waited, um, and probably because it's an official car, like of an ambassador or something. So oh, again, the police opened the, the curtains, and I was I just found myself with my plain uh, black shirt standing in the middle of, of the same <laughs> circle, and she was there. She was so beautiful. She was dressed so nice. She was so nice to me. And when I came, she said, "Oh, so I heard you are the Wonder Woman, the real Wonder Woman." Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> you know that was funny. That is. So and funny. I got a nice picture with her. Wow. I'll send you. She's not so sneer. So my daughter covered something, but it's oh, a, cool. So they yeah. Photoshop- oh, so nice. I could send you the picture. Wow. Um, yeah, it's just incredible that you're like finding yourselves with like these high profile people and they're, they keep on pointing to you and being like, no, 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 you're the one that we should be giving the cover to. It's really cool. So I heard you say a very nice story with, uh, Rivel Khan and Wasserman. Yeah. So he had a Shiva in Baranovich and, um, in Europe, um, before the, uh, the war and he loved his yeshiva, but he needed money for his yeshiva. So he traveled sometimes to the states and one time he took a boat it was it was not easy in those days he traveled for a few weeks and he came to miami and he tried tried to collect money and he didn't have a big uh um not a big success uh one day he met uh an old friend of him from the shtetl that they were learning together in cheder and his friend uh came years before to the state and uh, to the states and had a big coat factory and he was very rich he had a lot of money um and that friend saw, saw uh, Rabbi Hanan and said oh Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Rasselman what are you doing here so Rabbi Hanan said listen um 
I, I have a coat and one button fell off my coat. So I needed a tailor. Uh, so I came here. I want to sew my button back to the coat. So, so his uh, friend thought he's something happened to him, but he didn't say nothing. He's a, a big rabbi, I don't know. He, he, he didn't say anything. And Rebel Khan uh, went on and for a few more weeks he stayed and he tried to collect money, but um, he didn't get any uh, much more money. And the last day that he was uh, has to uh, had to go back home, he went again to visit his uh, friend and uh, again knocked on his door and said, Shalom, how are you doing? Uh, said to drink something with him. And again, the friend asked, Rabbi, tell me, why did you travel from Europe uh, to Miami? It's a long travel and it's not easy. So again, Rebel Hanan said, um, I have a good coat and one button fell off of it and I wanted someone good to sew it. So I came here. I'm looking for someone, to, for a good tailor to sew my button. So his friend like got, you know, and said, listen, Rabbi, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Can't be. You traveled so long just for sewing a coat, a, a, a button to a coat. Can't be. Tell me. What's the real reason that you are here? So Rabbi Hanan looked in his eyes and said, you think it can't be I came from so far to sew a coat? I think it's uh, ridiculous. You think you came from so far to have a factory of coats and just sew coats. I believe Hashem put you in this place and made you so rich so you could use your money for good things. And you know, my yeshiva needs some money. And he uh, for sure came out with a very good uh, check that evening. Mm. And I tell that story because I believe our neshama uh, didn't expand from seven rakim down here just for, you know, uh, having nice clothing and eating good. And even that just for, you know, having good, uh, nice children and, and having nice families. I think we have, we are we're here on duty. We have something to, to say and to leave after us. And again, in, uh, when I tell the story, I always think about my parents, and about my grandmother and about my f- husband's parents. They all took very hard decisions in their lives, left behind them very good lives over here and came to Israel uh, for and they were telling us they they did this because they were believing they believed in Israel the children will get uh, better chinuch, uh, better yeshivas and things like that. And again, I'm, I don't think they asked Shilas. They were they believed in something, so they went they went for it. They stood for it, and um, they stood for their values. It's really beautiful. Okay, so before I ask the the last questions as we wrap up, there's also just like one other quick story. If you could just quickly say your interaction with the Queen of Spain. Ah. Uh. Uh, she was, we were in Spain for a state visit and she, and they had, they really hosted us very nice. Um, and again, we finished all the official professional meetings and uh, we were invited for a, a state dinner. And after the state dinner was like a small talk around drinks. And um, and I was standing and talking with my uh, friend and she she's, she's, she's beautiful. The two of them are beautiful, but she's really beautiful. Um, and that's King Philip the Fifth, I think, or maybe the sixth. And she's Letizia. Her name is Letizia. Uh, she was an anchor before. And then she met the the king and she became a queen and she's very influential. And also she's a very like um, uh, style. Uh, she She's known at the world. She's a yoga. She, she's very uh, famous and a lot of people work just uh, going around her and trying to grab a selfie with her. And she she seemed like uh, tired. Uh, I was standing with a friend of mine and we were chatting and drinking. And and I don't know how it happened. She was like behind of me. And, uh, and, I, and I told my friend, it seems not easy to be a queen. And she heard that and she like turned uh, over to, to us and said, good evening. Who are you? Uh, did you enjoy the evening? And I said, yeah, it was a beautiful evening, beautiful music. The food was good. Uh, and I don't know why my friend said, you know, Rivka has 11 children. I don't know why she said that. Yeah. And she, is that true? Listen, I have two daughters and it's 
It's so hard. I can't manage. Tell me something. Tell me how do you do that? And she was, she didn't want to uh, leave us. And she was standing and talking. And the ceremony had to go on. So at one point, uh, they were sending some protocol people to take her. And she didn't move. So the king himself came and just catch her hand and said, Letizia, we have to go on back to the stage. We have uh, the ceremony to go on. And she said, no, no, I'm not coming. Listen, come, come, come. Listen to this story. This young lady has 11 children and he, and he stayed. <laughs> wow. Yeah, he had questions. Wow. Okay. This, I'll send you the picture. Yeah. So, um, okay. So we're, we're going to wrap up quickly because I know you have to, to run somewhere else. Um, if there was one person in history you could spend an hour with, who would you spend it with? Okay, so um, maybe maybe Leonardo Cohen. Hmm. Why? Because if you if you read his his songs, so I I feel there's another level of meaning behind what people uh, always believe his songs uh, mean to be. So I would like to ask him about that. Beautiful. It is if. Is there one mitzvah out of the 613 mitzvahs that is particularly more important to you or more dear to you? Oh, well, um, I love Shabbat. I really love Shabbat. And when things like were daunting and hard for me, I used to, to put a few more minutes in Shabbat maybe light candles 10 minutes before, maybe stay 10 minutes after Havdalah. Um, and it, it always helped. And you know, uh, Hafez Chaim says that there's a bracha in Shabbat, there's a blessing in Shabbat. And if you give more time for Shabbat, your week is more blessed. And I, I really love Shabbat. It's really beautiful. I, I was going to ask you about a, a, mo a moment, a story that inspires you, but I, I think your Obama thing was, was your answer there. That's what you're referring to, right? Um, so I just want to finish off with, I'm actually curious, like, what are you up to now? And do oh. you plan on running for president or I don't know, other <laughs> high places in Israel? Um, so um, uh, I left uh, politics um, because we finished our uh, seven years term. Mm -hmm. The truth is that Bougie Her uh, Yitzhak Herzog, the new president, he offered me to stay with him. But I felt I need a break. And I went to private sector and I work for um, some uh, cyber community, uh, cyber company in Tel Aviv. And in, I, I enjoy that, but not enough. Yeah. So maybe, maybe one <laughs> yeah. day we'll. we'll I'm looking we'll see for it. something, yeah, more, um, less money and more <laughs> right. influential. Right. Okay. Incredible. Thank you so much for everything you've been doing until now and everything you'll do in the future. Here I am, <laughs> very excited for this this part in the interview with. Rebison Dr. Dina Schmidman, the director of the OU's Women's Initiative, to tell us about a lot of things that I think a lot of people know about, but there's so many things that I think particularly my listeners are going to like be like, their minds are going to be blown from what's going on. So could you give us a little taste of like what is going on with the Women's Initiative? Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. It's really exciting to have this conversation. Yes. So we are focused on, we really want to provide opportunities for inspiration and for impact uh, within the areas of Torah, leadership, and community engagement. And we have a myriad of programs really that fall within each area. And we're just excited to create a community of women around these three areas. It's so interesting because anytime I've had women on in this podcast, there's always an underlying like idea that they always like kind of express of like listen everything's great but we kind of wish there was more out there for women to connect whether to like i mean it's easy for me i'm a guy i, I go to shul i have my chabura my wife's over there like she's great and she has her connection with seminary but like and connected to shul but she's not the same you know has the same tools that i have so I, I want to hear about absolutely. What you guys are so doing. I think what you're sharing is that there are a lot of spaces or opportunities for men to gather and to connect. And what's exciting in terms of the programs that we've been developing is that we have created communities around these programs. So I'll take our flagship program, which has close to ten thousand women who are participating, uh, which is our Torah Nimecha Nachiomi program. It's a parak a day. And it's beyond the learning, which is being taught by women. 
And I think that in itself is super exciting to see these very accomplished, articulate women teaching Nach. But beyond that, knowing that you are part of the largest classroom in the world, the largest Torah learning community where everybody is hearing that's the wild. same thing. That's that's astounding and outstanding. I, I hear in there, I forgot her name and I would give her a shout out. There's someone on Twitter, don't remember her name, but she's always talking about like, oh, I just finished this and Nach Yomi, like she just keeps on going through it and she's so excited about it. And again, I don't think she's affiliated at all. She's just one of the students there, one part of the, the classes that she f- follows it online. It's remarkable. And you have from 11 year old girls to a woman who at the CM in January of 2022, joined for the next cycle at the age of a hundred. Wow. <laughs> That's Amuna and Bitachon. Yeah, that is. <laughs> and meeting people who are all over the world and hearing from them and sh- knowing that people are sharing the words of Navi that that's how they're connecting to each other, to their families, multi-generational, learning within families, young girls preparing for their bat mitzvah, uh, college students. It's just, it's enormous. It's enormous. That's really incredible. Okay, so before we, we, we give a plug to say like where people can find out more or if they want to donate, but like what are, I know there's like a, there's a trillion things going on in the women's initiative. So give us a taste of uh, like a few other things. Okay, thank you. Cause there are really so many. There's really too many. Like I, we could probably spend three hours <laughs> for on For sure, for sure. So let's let's make it organized. Tari Mecha Nach Yomi, Tari Mecha Parsha, Rosh Chodesh Lunch and Learn, Ideas and Inspiration for the Chagim, Yemei Ratzon, incredible. And that's in Torah. But let's talk about leadership. Let's go for it. Okay, so we have lay leadership development. So we have lay, lay Kodesh and Clay Kodesh. Uh, we have a Rebetzin Kala teacher, Kirov and Chinuch professionals fellowship, uh, a conference. We really, we, we need to support our leaders, uh, whether on the lay side, whether they're on the Clay Kodesh side. These are women who are investing in their communities and we need to be able to be there as the Orthodox Union. I think that communities themselves need to recognize the efforts of their leaders and for the leaders themselves to be networked and supported. And so we're very, very excited to invest in leadership because it's an exponential investment. You invest on the front end and the dividends are really, uh, really remarkable. That's really beautiful. What's like the feedback for the, the women that are involved or maybe they weren't so associated before, but then they like join, whether it's the leadership program or some of the Torah classes, like. What's then the feedback like? That's such a great question. There's a sense of connection, Mm -hmm. a remarkable sense of, wow, there are women who are like me, who I can connect with, who I can learn from, who I can be associated with, and who I can perhaps bring back to my community as Torah scholars, as having someone who's a mentor, it's it's a very powerful feeling of connection. That's really beautiful. Okay, so for someone who wants to get involved, they, they want to learn more, they want to donate money, where's the best place that they can find everything that you just said? So I would go to the website, ou.org slash women. I know that sounds terrible slash women, but okay. it's a good way to remember Honestly, it's it. it's easy. Yeah. I, 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 sometimes these like long domains are like, you can't remember it. Okay. So that's the main website there. And we have a link in the show notes for, for anyone listening or watching. So <laughs> they don't have to even remember. They just go to the bottom and just like uh, click. Okay. Super. Uh, OU.org slash women slash donate. Uh, supporting our program and investment in our programming is an investment in the community. And in terms of these individual programs, uh, I would direct, I'm going to select the Nachyomi because I think that that is really what people find uh, to be uh, very much of interest. And that's ou.org slash women slash Nach, N-A-C-H 23. I'm going to just finish off with this because we just did a whole episode. And I think the core of the episode was talking about like, you know, someone's values and and the fact that you know Rivka's a mother and she got so much respect from world leaders and I just find that it's so like great. Someone listens to that episode and they're like, "That's very nice," and that's her in her life. Like now, how could I tap into 
whatever my role in life is. And like, I just find this as such a great tool to be like, hey, you want to connect? You want to be a leader? Whatever it is, there's an amazing place and resource that you could really go and try it out and and just try it out. Like you'll, it, it speaks for itself. There's a huge menu. There's something for everyone. And that's why we brought in Rivka. Rivka's here for our Lay Leadership Summit that's taking place uh, next week. She's which it, this is maybe this is I don't uh, know exactly when it's right, airing so okay. maybe it was a week well, whatever but okay but like, I have to thank you guys that for bringing her in because literally I she was someone that I've always seen I'm like I great guest and her message is exactly the message that we want to share every person has potential every person has a unique piece of themselves they are unique and there are programs that may appeal to one type of person, but we have programming that will appeal appeal to you and you and you and you and you. There's just, there's something for everyone. And having Rivka here messaging those values, sense of conviction, sense of passion, we're thrilled. And I'm thrilled that she had an opportunity to speak with you. Well, thank you very much. Anyone watching or listening, go ahead and, and check them out in the links below. And um, yeah, thanks again. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. I highly recommend you go check out your goals video. Um, and the code word, if you got this far in the video, to code word that I know that you, and I see every single comment, that I know that you've gotten this far, far you say, um, thinking, uh, oh, tov, the Hebrew word. Uh, and I'll spell it T-O-V, it means good in English. And that's how I know you got this far. If you enjoyed this episode, or you know someone that watched Rabbi Yol Gold's incredible video, go check it out if you haven't, then go ahead and share this episode with them. I think this gives a lot more depth to that story. Obviously, Rabbi Yol Gold crafted the story in however long, 13 minutes, whatever it is. This is like a little more long form, and I get to ask Rivka about her life and her experiences. And um, yeah, really incredible. Very indebted to Rabbi Yol Gold for finding her for me. I, I, I wouldn't have known who she was, although she was like making such a big impact in the world and if you didn't yet go check out the unrestricted podcast and as well the ou women's initiative changing lives so go ahead and check out the link in the show notes there to see how you can get involved we are coming to you with a really 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 artistic episode next week perhaps the biggest artist i've ever interviewed and code word artist there so you'll you'll see what i mean I think you'll be excited. So if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe. Keep on being an inspiration for the nation. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.